This is the Power Within America podcast, and today we've got an interview with the back-to-back national champ, Shane Nutt. Shane will be making his second straight appearance at the Junior World Championships in Romania on September 1st. He talks about his epic battle with Peyton Johnson at Nationals and their upcoming rematch at Worlds. We go through his whole open power thing and backstory and a whole lot more. Shane is a savvy veteran at this point and drops a ton of wisdom throughout, so make sure you listen close. We've also got registration live for all of our national championships in 2024, which are pinned to the top of the events tab on our website. Go there and get registered now before all the spots are gone. While you're there, show your support for the squad. Get a power America shirt or hat from the PA store link below. Thank you to SBD and Aleco for their continued partnership with Powerlifting America. If you're looking to compete in drug tests of Powerlifting, whether you're just starting out or you want to compete with the best in the world, make sure to go to powerlifting-america.com and become a member. Now let's get to this interview with the back-to-back national champ, Shane Nutt. It's not picking any of that up. It's not. I'm not surprised because it, it's my mic. My mic's all weird. Your mic is pretty good, actually. It eliminates the background sounds. Exactly. Yeah. So like whenever me and my buddies are playing like video games every once in a while and like we play this one game called Hunt, and um, it's a Steam game, but <clears throat> the the loading screen takes forever. So I'm, like, sitting there. I'm like, all right, I'm bored. I'm going to start playing. So I'll just, like, you know, because it's right there. And they're, like, all they can hear is, like, every once in a while me singing, but they'll never hear, like, the guitar. And they're like, dude, I'm going to mute you. <laughs> That's funny because all they hear is your voice. Yeah, it probably mm-hmm. sounds bad without the guitar. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all right. It's just, uh, yeah. Just pulled Man, I'll be there. there from the 26th, so I'll be chilling. <laughs> oh, perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, so I, just your... don't, I just don't worry about that stuff till the week of because my life's kind of crazy, and I'm like, I'll figure out programming that week, so it's fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, what's your what's your strategy then? You're getting out there pretty early then? You're getting out there, looks like, damn, a full, yeah. almost oh, yeah. a week, or almost a full week early. Yeah, the, uh, the flight there is going to be rough maybe not as rough as you know people on the west coast of the united states like you know peyton the guy that i went up against but um yeah um yeah either boise yeah so you know i'm flying from indy to duels and duels to turkey and turkey to romania i don't even i don't even want to look at how many hours it is it's just like me personally i'm not a big flying guy but i fly a lot i mean it's Mm. just like it's just stressful for me and it's but for worlds, I don't think it'll be a problem. I just, I mean, at any time, it's just like, it's just something that bothers me a little bit. <laughs> I'm like, it, ah. it bothers me. It bothers me. Yeah. A lot of people say there's been actually a lot of chatter about this. We can talk about it um, because you've competed internationally now a few times. It's my third, you, third year. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and I remember I talked to Anthony um, like about, you know, before junior nationals. And I was like, I could tell that Shane was like the daddy of the group. He was like taking all the little kids underneath his arm and uh, being like, it's all, everything's going to be all good for you kids. Cause you have been there, done that and done the travel before, but yeah. What are some, some of the things? Cause like one, one take that's out there right now is that travel has no effect or that it has no effect that you can't basically pr- prepare for and mitigate. Um, mm. So what, what, what's your take on that? Can you swear? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, that's, that's BS. Like if you ask me, that's yeah. just BS because I mean, if you're flying two hours, three hours, whatever. I mean, you being in the air that long and traveling for the day to get to the airport, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't really matter. But if you're if you're doing an international flight and it's funny because I talk to people that are like USPA, people who don't go in world championships, they're not part of the IPF or anything like that. And they're, yeah. They really like look forward to the experience. Um, and then they always ask me about it. But my personal take is, I mean, how how well do you deal with stress for me personally? I deal with it. Okay. But I'm like a control freak. So that's, that's kind of like the anxieties that kind of creep in. So like, is my bag going to get lost? Like, you know, how how much do I have to pay for this and this and this? I mean, it's an expensive thing too, but for the most part, like when you're actually going there and traveling, it's a long trip, man. You're sitting there. If you're cutting weight, you're trying to diet. I mean, you can pack you know, meals on the, on the plane and stuff too. And I think that's I, ideal for a lot of people and I advise them to do that. Um, but once you get there, I mean, you're what, eight hours, your eight hour time difference, nine, 10. Yeah. Like that's insane. Um, and I forgot who it was, um, who told me it was, uh, it was, I think it was Gavin, Gavin, Gavin Ain told me, he's like, Hey, you know, when we got to Turkey last year, 
he told me he's like yeah what taylor atwood said it might have been you actually taylor atwood's like hey when you're there it, depending on how long you're there you know if you compete in three days he's like just sleep at every single moment you can if you're jet lagged mm-hmm. and he, he's like that's pretty much all you can do but in this case with me being there a whole week early i'm i'm probably going to resume my regular sleep cycle and then fix it throughout the week but it does mm-hmm. i think it definitely does it's if you're not prepared for it, it's going to mess you up. But if you're prepared for it, it's going to mess you up a little bit less. <laughs> but yeah, I definitely think it's just, it's not like a net zero change. It definitely, you know, is an impact. And then when you, not only that, but when you get there and you're in a, it's almost like when we were in Turkey, I felt the most, the, the farthest, well, in, I guess, furthest away from the United States as possible. Yeah. Cause it's like, you're trying to get food. You've just got off this plane for nine hours. Ten hours, however long it was. And, you know, the people don't speak English. You don't have internet connection, so you can't use Google Translate. And you're like, they're like, okay, here's spaghetti and meatballs. It's colder. <laughs> That's crazy, man. I you mean, know how it was. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I wasn't there with you guys, but I followed it closely. I was yeah. paying attention in the group chat and everything like right. that, what you guys were saying. Um, how did Turkey, how was the difference between Turkey and Estonia? Cause I know you went over there for the university world cup, right? Okay. So as far as I, I kind of separate into two, two, maybe three different categories, but as far as like the experience that you have with all your buddies that, and the friendships you'll make is just second to none, but, um, competing, competing wise did really well for the most part. Um, due to like the travel variables um, in uh, in Turkey. Now in Estonia, I think is just about eight, nine hours flight. I don't remember exactly, but because it was a while ago. Mm-hmm. Um, I think since that was my first international meet, I wasn't, like I said, I wasn't really prepared for it. So like that kind of hit me. Um, and um I was also injured, so it's completely different. But as far as like like it back to what I was saying, the if you're not prepared for it, it's probably gonna it's probably gonna affect you pretty bad, um, pretty negatively, um, some way, one way or another. But um, so I did what I did um, travel and then lifting and friends. So yeah, I mean, but Estonia in general, I I didn't really like Turkey a whole lot. I thought it was beautiful. Don't get me wrong, it's beautiful mm-hmm. to be on that side of the world. But when I went to Estonia, like that was awesome. Like it was just so cool. I don't really know how to explain it. The people there were really, really nice. Um, you know, the town life was cool. Like we were, we were right in, I think Tartu is what it was, or I think we flew into Tallinn and then it's like a four hour shuttle, five hour shuttle to Tartu. Wow. That was terrible. That was like the worst travel experience of my life and going to Estonia and coming back. That was Rough. Yeah, I still remember how t- tired I was getting dropped off at Chicago. And I was like, I've been up for like 20 hours. This is ridiculous. Cause I can't sleep on flights. I guess. On international flights. Now I probably could a little bit better, but before yeah. I was like, I've never been on a plane this big before. <laughs> I was just thinking I lift off the ground. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's just an absolute. A lot of adrenaline and stuff too, probably like a lot of excitement for your first international um, competition and stuff like that. Whereas now you're a little bit more of an OG veteran of the game. And so, yeah, you could probably chill a little bit more in the flights, but I know, man, like for me, just sitting like as, as a bigger person, you know, like I'm an, I'm a 93 also. And it's just like being hunched over in a little chair with the tight shoulders. Like my shoulders are always super tight afterwards. And you definitely need some time to recover from that. My yeah, you got are... stinky people next to you, man. Yeah, it's it's mm. tough, man. It's not nothing. I I think it's definitely sure. something. Um, you can you can definitely prep for it, and you can mitigate the factors. But I mean, it's gonna take a toll to a certain extent. Um, one thing on the sleeping schedule once you get there is like it really depends a lot on what your what time you're lifting at too. Because like I was just saying you're lifting at like 5 30 PM, which will be like 11 or something, 10 AM, uh, East coast time. So if you're normally training 10 AM, whatever, like that, that might not be so bad for you, but for some of these people lifting at 8 AM in, in, uh, Romania, that's like 2 AM or something back in East coast time. And even later, if you're, if you're from the West coast and stuff like this, and so it's going to be much more difficult in, in Malta, 
all, since all of our lifters were in that prime time session, which would be like roughly around like noon or 2 PM Eastern time, they could kind of get away with staying on the same schedule where it was sort of like they would, they would sleep in until like, like noon and then go to weigh ends. And that would be like the equivalent of us sleeping into like 9 AM, 8 AM in the U S. And so you could kind of stay on that schedule, stay up late, which is, you know, um, uh, late for, for Malta time, but it was like, you know, midnight, um, whatever, 9 PM, something like that as a time as a bedtime and stuff like that. So it really can depend on when it, exactly what time you're competing, if you want to plan it out that way or not. But I think it's tough to be on trying to stay on us time when you're in a different country and the sunlight's coming through your windows and everyone's eating breakfast and Red you're going to skip, yeah. you're, you're going to miss breakfast and this and that, you know, everyone's going to dinner and lunch and shit. So you can try to do that. It might help if you just fly in two days before, but if you're trying to do that for a week, eventually the, the daylight is going to catch up with you, you know? I think one thing that I, I didn't really think about till last year, I was like, cause how many hours ahead are they? You know? I think this is plus seven from Eastern time. Okay, um, so and plus, I, plus, plus six, I think was Turkey. Mm-hmm. So something like that. generally like in the U S and not like big meets, you're going to compete unless it's like a, yeah, like, and not big meets. So if you're at a local meets, most likely gonna be a Saturday or Sunday. Most people yeah. will coach this program around that. And I'm like last year, I think I competed on Friday, so I can't quite remember, but I was like, I was like, okay, so it's a day earlier than I usually like perform and taper for, but on top of that, there's seven hours ahead. So I was like, so realistically, like, it's like, you know, it's almost like you're performing, like, I think late evening Thursday. Yeah. Um, So, or something like that. I don't know. I did, I did the calculations of the exact hours when I did set my watch. Yeah. And I was like, okay, here's, you know, I just did the math and I was like, because for some people that really matters for, you know, like females, like, Hey, I am yeah. used to taking my exact, my last bench day, you know, the day before the meet at this time, like that might make a difference, you know, even the session before that or whatever. So, but I think what helps a lot of people and I hear like a lot of people like, Oh, it doesn't matter. I'm like, okay. Does it like, Give me, give me your reasonings. And then who are you in this sport? Cause if you're Taylor Atwood and you're telling me it doesn't matter if you're Austin Perkins and you're telling me it doesn't matter if you're, you know, Hey Zeus telling me it doesn't yeah. matter. I'm like, okay, that's probably valid to a certain extent. Cause you've mentally prepped for it to the point where like, okay, I don't care if it's 11 PM or 2 AM my time on a Thursday, I'm taking my pre-workout and I'm ready to rock right now. That's great. Some people can't get past that. Um, that's what I'm saying for those kind of elite lifters. It's not because like, oh, they're naturally better, but like that is huge, like for them. And that's kind of how I go about it too. Is like when you're in, like, are you gonna sit here and worry and psych yourself out about when the best? Yeah, you can try to figure out what the best taper and your schedule is for that week, but like for the most part, generalize it and then as as specific as you can without kind of going crazy about it. And then yeah. you know, here's the day I compete. Cool rock on let's try to let's try to get my sleep right so that way when we get there i'm not it's not like you feel like it's 3 a.m you know try to get like like the advice i was given sleep as much as possible i think when i was in turkey i could never switch my clock over i was still i was staying up all night and waiting and sleeping during the day i went competing i felt completely fine yeah exactly don't know yeah. You don't want a nocebo effect someone. And that was one of the big concerns of one of the people I talked to. That's very, you know, in the camp of like, you can prepare and mitigate all of the travel um, effects and things. And obviously in other sports, they do, they travel a lot as well. Like if they will get tennis, like they'll finish a tennis match and fly to a totally different part of the world and get right back into training and things like this. So it's definitely possible. Um, but you also don't want to like overthink it too, and get to the point where you're like, oh, my total is for sure going to go down because I'm going to an international competition. Everyone says your total goes down. It's like, no, you see people like Natalie Richards um, hitting PRs, breaking world record. Anytime someone's breaking a world record total at an at a international competition, which happens at damn near every international meet, they're doing something no one's ever done before after traveling. So it's obviously possible to do. So you don't want to psych yourself out, but it's definitely, it's definitely something that, especially if you're new in the sport and this is your first international competition, take it seriously and prepare for it and plan for it. And you should be fine. Yeah. And it's really hard for people to um, conceptualize the whole thing until, until they actually go through it. I feel like yeah. 
you're not going to like that, that little bell in your head is going to keep going off that that anxiety is going to keep going off about yeah. like oh, what about this and being control freak but it's like once i'll tell you what once you're there you're like thank god i'm i'm freaking here yeah and then what can i control right now like okay who yeah. speaks english where's my food where's my water where's my hotel room i'm gonna yeah. shower sleep figure out the rest how do i crank the ac up in here and get to bed <laughs> was a problem last year they had two ac units in in almost every hotel room i believe one was like into the wall and um part of like the original hotel infrastructure and like the the that didn't work but then i think when they refurbished it they put in one of those giant like cooler heaters up in the ceiling and then it has a vent to go outside and it's external remote control so people were thinking that was like to a tv remote or whatever but even wow. then like you would click a button and then you wouldn't know what what setting it was on and you'd also had to go turn it on but like it was like scorching hot out there but then once you got the ac figured out dude like you wake up it's like 62 degrees <laughs> yeah and then you can sleep in yeah um that's the thing like having a having a team it's cool because we'll have each other's backs like the equipped the equipped lifters go first they're the guinea pigs that are going to have to figure all this stuff out. And then we'll relay the information to everybody. We'll go room to room and turn on the freaking ACs if we have to, like whatever. Yeah, who's got a scale? Who's got a microwave, I guess? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. apparently a microwave is a big problem yeah. that we're looking at right now. It's like, maybe yeah. we're just going to buy a microwave for the whole team. Probably like Alibaba one or something. I don't know. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, that's interesting, man. Those are good takes. I mean, my pro tip for uh, getting on the uh, time zone, because I, I travel to India quite a bit. My wife is from there and that's going to the to back east, you know, where you're going forward in time. And basically my pro tip that I always have is when you land, when you get there, stay up, don't go straight to sleep, stay up until it's nighttime. And it's like the right time, you know, like normal bedtime time, like eight, nine, 10 o'clock, whatever. And then go to bed and just push through that first day. Because if you if you land, let's say you get in at 10 and you get in the hotel by noon and you go straight to sleep and then you wake up at eight o'clock at PM after eight hours of sleep, then you're, it's going to be very hard for you to get back onto the, you know, staying awake. Absolutely. In the day. And people do it all the yeah. time. You know, Oh, I stayed up late. I yeah. stayed up till 2 AM. And then all of a sudden it becomes a habit for you and you're waking up yeah. at 11, 11 in the morning. And now you know, now you're like still going to bed like way later in the day. So yeah, it's the same thing. That's what I did. At, that's what I did when I went to Turkey, but yeah. I couldn't naturally, I was on a weird sleep schedule at the time. I would, I would work for the evening. Um, cause doing in-person training and stuff, people get off at work, all my clients and stuff at like, you know, business hours. So I'd yeah. be in the gym until nine and I'd finish all, you know, walking my dog, hand out family, making dinner, whatever. So I'd be going my free time, you know, I'd be pretty late most nights yeah but when i got on that plane that's what i did everyone else yeah yeah i think anthony and um and alex they're all knocked and i'm like sitting there watching watching a movie or whatever and, and yeah yeah was over there snoring and and um dude i after that first night though i could not get my sleep cycle right but i followed that rule just like hey just sleep whenever and as yeah. much as possible and that's what we did and I, I that's what i did and i felt fine i was yeah. i was i think I was like in, I was like in this adrenaline loop, uh, loop like all week too, where like I was so on edge about stuff that like it almost got to the point where like sleep was like not really a big thing anymore. I was like, mm -hmm. I was, I was just sleep. I was resting when I was tired, but I was like, dude, I'm so ready to go right now. And you have so much anticipate anticipation sitting there for a whole week, dude. And <laughs> you, yeah. you get bored. You're like, what do I do? Because you're in this hotel in the middle of nowhere for five, six days before you compete with nothing to do except hang with up, hang, hang with friends, maybe your last sessions in and, you know, yeah. Yeah. It's looking at risky in some places to where, where you want to go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you guys were just sort of trapped in the hotel last year in Turkey because there wasn't, no, we weren't, <laughs> no. you were, you were you were out in the middle of a field, weren't you? We were, but like we had a vehicle, bro. Oh. We had a car and we were going everywhere. We were going to the oh. markets. We didn't even know what places we were at. We just drove down the road until we found a, you know. That's different. That's That was just you and your crew that had a car. Yeah. You guys yeah, ran in a car was, then? Um, One of uh, 
I don't know if I should say his name, but one of our friends ended up doing that. And yeah. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> Mike. Mike Gold. Yeah, he's on Mike. our show. He's on our <laughs> show. He's on I'm going to say show. it anyway. Yeah, he's already yeah. been. So yeah, he had a vehicle and it was this like little like rental Clio car, dude. And we were just flying. We would go wherever we want. We didn't know where we were at, but yeah. like we just, okay, we have to remember how we get back because the GPS wasn't always working you know, on all of our phones. And yeah, Mike was, he was so gracious to let us do that. And that, that gave us resources. No one else had like by, by all means. I mean, we didn't yeah. see many other people in a rental car no. <laughs> and Americans alone, none, but that's crazy. Yeah. So like we, you know, closest friends, like, Hey bro, you need anything? I'm going to the market down the street. Good. So, that's cool. Um, yeah. Mike Gold is one of our co-hosts on this show uh, hmm. on, our, on our Monday night live podcast. And then also uh, in Malta, he was doing our pregame shows and press conferences with us and stuff. He's part of our squad. So um, we can get some, you can give some insights on Mike, how Mike Gold's training is going. Cause you're his yeah. coach, aren't you? <laughs> he's great. Yeah, he's great. He's a great athlete um, yeah. by all means. So um, that's cool. Very communicative. I mean, he follows what I tell him and we're, we're we've got some good momentum i think it's like four months now maybe five yeah he's <laughs> doing this sc- he's doing the scary strong oh since you've been coaching him you mean i'm sorry he cut out i'm sorry so um it's been four or five months that you've been coaching him is that what i you're believe saying? so yeah okay yeah and he does he does really well so i mean his lifts aren't going down by any means so that's that's good his confidence we had some injury stuff that was had to be resolved and i helped him through that as well and you know just being integrative with the, with the programming and, and stuff that he does, you know, and luckily I've had a lot of direct experience with a lot of redundant powerlifting injuries. So that helped. Um, yeah. But I also have my resources and people and help me out through that. But yeah, he's, he's doing really well now. He's healthy. He just doesn't lift with any pain. His bench is skyrocketing right now. Yeah. He's got so, a big bench. Yeah, it is. He's doing really well right now. So proud of you, Mark. <laughs> and he's like yeah. the, He's like the number one powerlifting stat god out there, dude. Like he knows more about me and my stats in powerlifting than I do, I'm sure. He'd probably be able to tell me right now what my PR in every single meet is, how many meets I've done, (laughs) what my last weigh in and lot number was. Yeah, hundred percent. He would. Um, that's, I actually wanted him to be on this podcast, but he's like, he said he's traveling or something right now, but, um, but yeah, no, he, we lean on him super heavy for his analysis, man. Like he's, he's one of the best analysts in the game when it comes to powerlifting for sure. Valid, you know, unbiased for the most yeah. part, you know, and he'll give you, he'll give you his honest opinion, whether you like it or not. Yeah, which I love. Yeah. He's, he's great for us. Got a lot of insight. Uh, for sure. Yeah. It was funny because uh, we were talking about, um, we've talked about it a few times on our Monday night live show um, about the battle that you had with Peyton. And he has mentioned a few times that like anyone who knows uh, Shane's training knew that he had no business loading that third deadlift and that there was no way that he was actually going to try to come out and take that third deadlift. And then it just so happened that, you know, Peyton, you know, sort of fell for it and, and went out and tried to pull it and, and both of you miss and you were ahead and that was the game that was the strategy and you got that kind of easy dub in the last in the last pull there where you didn't even need it um but yeah he he's mike gold is really good about pointing out that kind of stuff because i'm like i don't know i thought shane could pull it i mean i i thought i i think on a good of- day on a good day that i don't squat 672 and it doesn't feel like garbage yeah i'm not gonna lie so like i didn't do a whole re- like a now that I, you know the meet's over and everything i've done recaps and things i need to you know improve on for the next meet but like yeah. i've had i've had this history of being tired going into uh-huh. those it's gotten better with the training tweaks i've had since since turkey last year 100 percent, and my performance has gone up tenfold on specific yeah. days spd days you know one rep stuff as you've seen i mean i posted you know i think as early as <clears throat> I think I stopped regularly posting around April or May. Mm-hmm. Life got busy, but um, like my, I was hitting PRs, like, and it wasn't like, oh, I hit an eight thirty kilo total this week. It's like, no, I did that today, and that was better than two blocks ago, which was eight sixteen, and vice for you know, keep going, keep going. So like, it's my training is very specific. So um on that me particularly i think i peaked my squat incorrectly but my squats arguably my, my strongest lift um okay. it it feels the best i love my squat when my squat feels 
painless and, and like just powerful. I'm like, dude, I throw anything on that bar. I do not care. Um, now going into that, I think after my first attempt, I was like, I think I'm getting sore. So I think I tapered myself a little too early, um, on that. And that, that was totally my fault. So, um, seeming how I'm, you know, lifting on a Friday for, for this meet, I think it won't be a problem with a few other tweaks. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I think I just overestimated the peak, um, paper. So, um, but yeah, I, I, I don't know how, I don't know. I don't want to, I don't want to spill too much about training and stuff now, but yeah, yeah of course don't, uh, don't reveal too yeah, much or, or any tactics or anything like that. But yeah, yeah. Uh, but well, for we've, most already, part, yeah. we've already had Mike gold go through and analyze all the tactics that went down in Scottsdale. So I, I know for a fact, Peyton is going to be ready for that move. Yeah. So you better be one step ahead as far as if you got any tricks up your sleeve. And of course, you know, we're going to have uh, the coaches divide up who they're handling. So you'll have one coach, he'll have another coach, and you guys can just go straight to battle. Like, it's not going to be a situation where one yeah. coach is trying to call numbers for both and has an idea right. of what you're capable of. It'll be straight up battle with all the strategies and all the things that you can do. Um, but you yes. won't have Chloe there, your secret weapon, who yeah help, help secure the dub. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Unfortunately, she's in medical school right now, so we just can't. We couldn't besides the fact of getting married too it's expensive but <laughs> yeah man speaking of which shit i forgot to mention happy congratulations on your marriage man thank you thank you it's freaking awesome yeah it's a long time coming <laughs> it, it has been a long time coming <laughs> yeah yeah you guys yeah. felt like you're already married before but um yeah exactly. it's good to make it official and looks like you had a beautiful wedding and everything too with a lot of yeah home. it was awesome man we had you know austin perkins was our flower boy and nice for people who don't know which i'm sure everyone knows if you know us personally but we're, we're we all kind of like grew up through college and stuff we're all like really really close knit. we still are for the most part and um so yeah lex jones was a you know bridesmaid and um yeah. cole Metz. i don't know if you remember anything about cole Metz, but he was he was one of my groomsmen so i've heard stories oh yeah and there's like the number one viewed ipf video ever yeah on youtube is him throwing up i'm pretty sure so yeah exactly. but no yeah dude it was beautiful it was very intimate um 100 100 person wedding in pigeon forge tennessee it was just it was on a mountaintop and it was awesome so. yeah it looked beautiful it looked like you guys had fun and came out in high spirits and everything and mm -hmm. so um let's let's go back to talking about international travel and stuff in worlds for just a second we will get into the full scottsdale recap um in a second here but the other thing i wanted to bring up was just like besides going and competing and all that stuff, like you made some really good friends in Turkey. Like you guys came back as boys, like you never met these guys before. And then, you know, Alex and Anthony and Yaya, you know, now you guys are like super tight. So tell me about, like, I think I saw Alex was at your wedding. Mm -hmm. Alex was there too. Yeah, I forgot to mention that, but uh, yeah. man, so it all started with us. I think it was me and Alex. We met at me and Alex. Um, no, me and Anthony. <clears throat> we met at um drug testing <laughs> it was like me him and lane norton were getting drug tested in orlando uh, in orlando and then we just started small chat whatever you know and um you know i ended up getting his number and stuff and then from there like hey let's you know let's you know let's like link up and hang out at worlds because you know at that point in time we, we knew it we we'd won so um we were sitting there waiting at the airport um, I think we we're in Chicago and we waited for like four hours. So there's a lot of, you know, a lot of talking, a lot of like um, befriending going on there. And yeah. we were waiting on, we were waiting on Yaya and he's like, you don't know Yaya. And I was like, no, I don't, I don't even, cause back to what, I mean, kind of what we're going to talk about is I don't really watch a whole lot of powerlifting. Like, yeah. <laughs> shame me. But like, he's like, you don't know Yaya. And I'm like, no, who is he? He's like, he's hilarious. And the first, like, couple sentences that came out of Yaya's mouth had me rolling and we were just you know ever since then he was like man he's just he's just awesome he's a funny guy so he was he he couldn't make it to my wedding and um um neither could Anthony because of um certain schedule conflicts but yeah. um you know they were supposed to be there too um but yeah and then um you know I think me and um Alex 
once we kind of real Alex Orlarte, once we kind of realized we were like, Hey, we're kind of like fighting for the same team here. And he was, he was kind of coming down as like, he's like, man, I'm like injured. Like, I don't, I don't really yeah. know. So once it came down to it, like it was a lot of camaraderie and cheering each other on. Cause I'm like, dude, you can't like, <laughs> you know, he had, I think he failed to squat twice and then he took his third, finally got it. But like he was having major back problems and I, I wanted him to, like, to compete against me. Like, but I know there was not one bone in my body that wanted to say like, Oh, let's get this dude out of here. So I'm like, it was not selfish at all. And I was like, that was something special to me because I was like, at, at that point in time when we were at the world championship, I was like, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And I want you to do what you can do. And when it comes down to it, that's going to be the podium. But I was like, I can't, you know, this guy was like in really bad. Bad spirits after. So trying to cheer each other on and as much as possible. And so that's how I kind of became friends with him. So, yeah. Um, and then, you know, throughout the entire week, we were just, we'd meet up, we'd rally, we'd eat after like two hours of waiting for food. So we just sit there and just shoot. And, um, you know, we'd watch and cheer each other on as they lifted and, you know, we'd go hang out by the pool and drive around wherever cities we were at. I don't know where we were at, but yeah, <laughs> you know, it's just, it was such a grand time, man. It was such, it was so wholesome. And, um, those guys are awesome. They're very genuine. Yeah. And people. I'm so I really enjoyed them and, um, you know, blessed to be friends. And yeah. And that's a way, like, I mean, that's one of those things that happens at these international competitions where you don't necessarily become boys overnight at nationals. You know, it's like, it's when you go to another country and you go through all those experiences and you spend all that downtime together and all that kind of stuff that you bond for real, you know, and then yeah. next thing you know, you're, they're showing up at your wedding and stuff. You came up to Buffalo, um, when, when Anthony was competing and we had ourselves a ball that night, I was there for that one. Yeah, you cut yeah. out a little bit. You said I came up to Buffalo and Anthony. Yeah. yeah, that was an awesome time too. Yeah, that was in, that was probably the best PA meet I've ever. That's probably the best powerlifting meet I've ever been to. <laughs> that was awesome, huh? That was, was a lot blast. of fun. Me, me and my buddies were. I mean, we're driving home. We're just talking because I brought two clients too, and you know, Dak and and another guy and um, Dustin, and we're just talking about you know how how great that was, and that was one of my other clients first meets i was like did you have no idea how blessed you were just doing that meet because you know been lifting for almost nine years now and i was like that's one of the best meets i that was ever thrown organized afterwards you know going out to eat everyone hanging out and that was just so cool man yeah but it was also partially the fact that like anthony came out you came out um there was a lot of people in the room like like a lot of people who had like world's level experience and stuff like joy was there joy was Uh, there yeah and it was just Audrey came with, with mm-hmm. Anthony, you know, so it was like, we just had a, a squad afterwards and we went out all night and like, we didn't get home till like three, four in the morning. You came through clutch with having your truck. We piled like, like 15 people <laughs> in your truck and like went from bar to bar. It was like, it was a blast, man. That was, yeah. that was definitely like a core memory, but that's the kind of thing, like, you know, partially how that happened was like your relationship with Anthony and being like, Oh, you know, I'm going to come on up there for that meet, even though it's a long ways for you, long drive and stuff part of the the bonus of it was being able to see him again and hang out with all of our crew and everything that was going to be at the meet with Vin and everything. So yeah, man, it was just, it was great. It's like, it's like powerlifting family. Yeah. That was, that was one of my favorite memories of this entire year, actually. Yeah. That was a blast. That was a hell that, of a That was sure. related to powerlifting hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So anyway, so these are the things that, you know, for the young uh, audience out there, that's maybe they're going to worlds in Romania for the first time and stuff. This is the stuff you have to look forward to. You know, you're about to have yourself. <laughs> Just a be safe and responsible as, as much <laughs> as possible. John Burford down in Cayman Islands uh, for NAPF. He, he, his little speech he gave to the athletes before he let them run off and do their thing was don't take away from the population and don't add to the population. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that was a good advice. Good. Oh advice. Lord, I've never heard that before, but that's must be a Louisiana thing. Well, that was pretty funny because you know they're all all those kids running around there, and they're all becoming best friends and stuff. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, on an island. Cool. Yeah, you put a bunch of teenagers on an island somewhere. That's what we they're, did. <laughs> and they're basically trapped in a hotel with like a little hotel beach, and that was it. Yeah. A hotel pool and beach. So yeah, yeah, it was super cool. But anyway, all right. So let's um let's go ahead and let's talk about a couple of the current events. So we'll I'll ask you the questions. Um, 
did you watch the world championships in Malta? No, you did not. All right. So I can't ask you any of the fun questions about the jury, the pace, um, all the little controversies that happened. Did you hear anything about it afterwards? Like, did you see Absolutely. on social media? On social Absolutely. Media? Yeah. I mean, I heard like, I didn't watch it like most people would. I would go on YouTube and watch or see people's meat recaps or see people's viral stories and stuff like that. Yeah. <clears throat> but for like, I think it was during the weekend and for the most part, like that's crazy for me right now. Um, but I don't know. I just, I didn't really like, like I'm going to watch the 93s or whatever. And I just, I just didn't do that. And, but I was, I was, I was really looking out for Lex Jones because I was like trying to, we were trying to find like the consistency on, on the shoulder depth thing, the elbow depth okay. thing. And that was what we were looking at. But I was seeing some calls that were just, I was like, come on. <laughs> so I, I know what you're talking about because I did see some. It like, yeah. It's different if you make a call and then you're consistent with that call. But afterwards, if someone's like, oh, this guy's at depth and now the standard's up here. So it's like, where are we at on the board now? So which is like one thing why I always preach to my lifters. I was like, if you, if you get depth at that, you know, if you get two to one on lights because of depth, I'm like squat like that again, because you're going to get two to one. Yeah. Don't change it up. It, it should be that way. Um, don't change it. So I did see some stuff, but I don't know. Are there, you want to talk about probably like the number one thing that happened? Yeah. Tell me what, what was it? Well, for you, I don't, I don't know what it was. I know that there was pretty bad controversy about stuff, but I didn't really go into depth about it. Do you want to tell me what it was? Well, there's was two. I mean, one was Taylor squat, uh, getting overturned and by the jury. And there was a lot of jury overturns that was controversial. And then of course, Bonica's bomb out on deadlift, which yeah, you have connections in the Omaha area and stuff like, I know uh, Bonica. Yeah. 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 My so brother you know. knows her really well. Cause he films, you know, does a lot of stuff. Yeah. Me. Yeah. So those were the two, those were like the two big controversies. I mean, Gavin got his squat overturned as well, which has been a common theme now. It happened at Sheffield and then happened there in, in really um, happened in Malta as well. But then Keiko went 27 white lights. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think I, I've been getting this a little bit wrong. I think Jessica Espinal got 27, 27 white lights. I think um, Natalie Richards got 27 white lights. Keiko got 27. I'm not sure if Waskar did. He came damn close if he, well, no, cause he misses, he missed his final pull. But, um, but yeah, so, I mean, some people went through the gauntlet and came through completely unscathed and other people came through bombing out, getting lifts overturned by the jury, you know, and then like in Taylor's case, losing the crown and finishing third. Hmm. So yeah, what was uh, the story? What was the biggest story takeaway that you were hearing after, after it, it since you weren't watching it like a hundred percent live? What were like, what were some of the stories I saw? Yeah, like what was the biggest thing that you saw that happened that you that you remember from it? I think I I, I obviously saw Bonica because me and Lex like we were we were watching competition. We weren't watching for enjoyment. We were watching for competition. Yeah, and, and um, we saw that, which is tragic, but yeah. rightfully so. I mean, it, it wasn't a judge thing. I don't think it was just I couldn't get weighed up, and that happens. But anyway, um, well. I think it was, I saw a lot about Taylor's stuff yeah. and it's been a minute since, but yeah, I did see a lot of stuff about Taylor, but, um, and I didn't even know that, um, Gavin was called like that. Um, yeah. was his third squat? Do you remember? Yeah, it was his, uh, third one. Um, I think they gave it to him and then they took it away again, which is exactly what happened in, in, uh, Okay, so that's what I remember. It was it wasn't because it was like it wasn't because of the, the original call. The controversy was the amount of jury overturns. Yeah, exactly. That's what I remember. So yeah, I know I don't want to be redundant, but yeah, that's that's pretty much what I recall from that. And I don't think that's ever happened to me. So and the another another thing was it had to do with the pace was like super fast because they had these two flights of eight. So like Jesus is squatting and he's got eight minutes basically to get ready for his next squat. Yeah, that's and, terrible. You know, Bonico talked about that a lot as well. And so it's just little things like that where you're going to have to, I think in Romania, I'm not sure that they're going to be doing that fast of flights. Um, 
but it'll be fast paced. It always is. And that that's kind of a that's kind of a topic is just like how do you prepare, how do you get yourself ready um, for that super fast pace at an IPF meet, and then also the the strictness of the standards. Um, I mean, first of all, always train the standard, and then don't accept anything less than that because they that a lot of people say, oh, you're going to total less when you go to international meet. It's like, it's not because of the travel. It's because of the judges. Like they are strict. Like they are very, very strict. Um, so that's, that's my, you know, my take on that. However, the, how fast it goes. I mean, don't be a person that takes eight minute, 10 minute rest times in between maxes. And that's definitely something that I've, I feel like, now that I think about it, I've subconsciously consciously put into because uh, my training is on Saturdays, I do heavy SPD stuff. So, and I have been for a while. Whenever I would be like, oh, I need to wait a little bit longer. I'm like, I try. I know a lot of people, like when they're going for a PR or something like that, they need a little extra time. Or I always have athletes like, how long should I wait? I'm like, just go when you're ready. But me knowing that like, you know, in a couple minutes here, I'm going to have to take my next attempt. Eight minutes for me in the meet is actually longer than what I do in the gym. Like I yeah. throw on, if I'm throwing on 585, like I'm doing 640 in, in a few minutes. Like I don't want to wait. The longer that I sit there and like, I'm like, I'm warm. That doesn't take a lot out of me, but like, and it says something about attempt selections too. And yeah. kind of going into that is how do you do your attempt selections at Worlds versus a local meet is are you going to go in the 99 percentile of your max on a second or 98 or 95 or whatever? You know, how close are you to a max on your second? Because especially on lower body lists, because just in a few minutes, you're going to have to take something again and pray God you hit it. So that's why I make big jumps. Um, I was going to say, so what yeah. is your strategy then? You you don't want to get near max on a second. No, my second is almost always as fast as my first. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people wouldn't really agree with that, but be, me being self-coach for as long as I'm coaching myself, um, probably five years now, is that's something that I do every single – I can tell you what I have range-wise within 50 pounds on on squats and deadlifts by the time I hit my opener like if I can't like just because I am so consistent with how I feel and that's why at every single meet until my deadlifts since 2018 I've called my squats and my bench attempts mm -hmm. to a T so I just know I just know because I'm like this is miss. how I train every single week I know exactly if if I feel like this on my opener I'm like I don't know what I'm going to be able to do my and second think, confirms it, but. And I'm looking here. I mean, going back to 2019, you've only missed one bench and one squat, and neither of them were third attempts. Uh, the squat was an opener, and the bench was a was a second attempt, and you went up and got it. Still, uh, yeah. you went up, went up after and got it. So yeah, you that's that's. I mean, you know your shit. Like as far as uh, is especially as far as squat and bench are concerned. Sorry. And so like, do, do you know, is there, is there like a percentage that you're looking at? Like, or if you could like make a metric of like roughly what you do, I mean, is it like roughly like around like 85% and then like 92%, something like yeah, that? Yeah, let me give you an exact. Um, so based off my squat max, 672. Don't reveal too much information here. Well, that's from my last means when I max. Yeah. So, um, gotcha. About 90% is an opener. Okay. And that's, um, that's what a lot of people do. Yeah. So 90, I go from 90 and then, you know, from there, it's kind of feeling it out too. It really depends on, on, on squat. It's more set in stone. However, on deadlift, it's a uh, deadlift is, is purely strategy and placement. I need one. Did I need one deadlift. I don't even need to pull my opener. I'm like, cause I'm ready. Cause if <laughs> I will tell you how many times in the gym that I go, from 585 to 675 to pulling a max. That is my warm up attempts. Okay. So, so it's you're just used like, to it. Yeah. I'm like, adding that extra bread to me is like, 
it's not too much on my body. It's like, I have only so much to give. And that's so like, I don't need to sit and try to figure out placings in between. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's just, that's how my strategy works. So. <laughs> no, that's cool. It, it, it just good. depends on the scenario though. Cause if you're at, if you're at an, a local meet, you can do a lot more with your attempts. You can, you can, win on a second attempt and not even have to take your third but at, at worlds yeah. it's different you know at worlds your margin i mean top five are within 20 kilos so definitely maybe and it's and it's um it's good to hear this like different approaches that people have and but i think one thing that you've you really nailing home is like your training is very specific. You know, your body, you actually train like, like around Saturdays with SBD days. And that's when you're going to compete. That's like very specific. That's more than just doing squat bench deadlift, like throughout the week or whatnot. It's like also adding in the, the weekly routine of like more often than not, you're going to compete on a Saturday. So mm -hmm. I want to be peaked. I want my body to know that Saturday is something big is coming and we better be ready for it. Mm -hmm. And I, like, <clears throat> My bench would be every time I go and, 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 and lift on Saturdays, my benches are always fatigued. Like they feel like garbage. And it's not necessarily because of how my other days stack up through the week. Yeah. It's just been a trend with doing the, the squat fatigue and then squat back downs and whatever else I have that day. Like for sure, squat fries me. So like being able to train through that fatigue, when I go to meet there, I'm like, dude, I feel fantastic. Yeah because all i've done is hit one squat that was relatively heavy and now i'm going to bench and i feel fresh and i made that change going into going into our last meet and that was that's why i had the best bench of my entire career i thought i was like dude i was playing it safe because i didn't want to fail because i knew peyton was he was a very strong lifter so i was like i i don't have any room for a failed attempt here so yeah uh, and i didn't at all i was right so when i did that i was happy with the pr but i definitely had more so I'm excited. It just depends. At worlds. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you can push it up further even at worlds, but I mean, it's again, you're it's the same game, same game. Yep. You're going to be in a battle with Peyton. Um, and then also there's other 93s out here, isn't there? Where are we at? I'm going to pull up the, uh, I'm going to pull up the nominations here. Peyton and then you long and, uh, the UK yeah, you long. Yeah. You long won last year. Cause everyone else kind of pooped the bed and yeah. He, uh, he was the best lifter that day. And that was, that was awesome to see. And that, I yeah. thought, you know, I was like, that was a learning, you know, that was, <laughs> I learned a lot from that. I was like, dang, this guy wasn't even, he wasn't even on the board, dude. No one was looking yeah. at him. And all of a sudden, like he made a meme about it too, after the meet. I <laughs> died. Um, but I was like, he, this guy, no one even knew who he was. And all of a sudden he's winning because everyone's shooting for top three and not paying attention who, Number five, number six is, and all of a sudden he, he waits till everyone fails and gets his last attempt and bang. And he's got a big deadlift too. It's not like he's, I mean, he's got a big squat. He's got a pretty, he's got a damn big bench too. So he's well-rounded, but I mean, he's got a big pull yeah. where he can pull for placing as yeah. well at the end. So that's going to be a hell of a battle. Um, this guy, Nathan, Nathan Javeo from yeah. Great Britain is in there. And then Peyton is right there too. I mean, it's a really tight battle. I think, I think Mike Gold was talking about this as being one of the most stacked weight classes. I think the 83s are also really, really stacked. Um, but yeah, yeah it's, it's, I'm just looking at this now and it looks like the top six are all going 800 plus on nominations. Yeah. And, and there's really only funny like, though. 31 kilos on nominations celebrates one through six. Yeah. This you know tough. what? You know what I don't like about nominations? And I'm not throwing shade to anybody at all. And I don't even know if this is completely true. Uh -huh. But every meet that I've ever done, I haven't had the opportunity to just go for, except for last year when I went on a second to just go for a third poll. Mm -hmm. So like I had nothing to lose, but like in the history of me competing, it's like, if being honest with you, I think the rankings are going to go me and Peyton. And then what's his, what's the UK guy name? Uh, Nathan Javeo. Nathan. Excuse me, Nathan. I know you. I met him last year. I just, I'm terrible with names. And then you long. That's your I'm, prediction. I'm sorry. I'm sorry if I, if I mess it up too. But anyway, um, just like the nominations don't, obviously they never mean anything. It, it yeah. never does. But like 
last year with my total, I was I was going in with like a, a pretty bad total because like I went on like a third attempt, just like, oh, for whatever's on because I already had, but like, you know, with other mm-hmm. people's meets they do, they're like, they're they're not competing against anyone. They don't have any risk factors, they don't have any pressure. It's like, okay, now the pressure's on. So let's see whose totals are what they are when there's pressure. Um, yeah. and that's what I love about looking at the predictions versus what actually happens to me versus like what's actually going into those predictions. Because for me and Hayden's predictions, it's like, because both of us had the potential total 830 to 840. Yeah. But one of us snubbed, snubbed the other from doing either. So yeah, Chloe did. Yeah. <laughs> she did indeed. And then they, that was his fault. Yeah. You know, him and his coach, I don't know what they were doing. We're not going to talk about it too much. I hope they learned from their mistake, but I don't know yeah. if it was talked about and we're not going to talk about it. Because... We, we, yeah. You don't need to talk about it because Mike gold, <laughs> Mike gold already went over it ad nauseum on Monday night live, like yeah. multiple times. Every time See, we talk about junior worlds, we highlight this battle um, because it's a rematch from our nationals, which is huge for us. Hopefully we're going to take one and two, whichever way. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, it's exciting. So no, we've, we've, we've beat the dead horse as far as Peyton, definitely. If he's listening to any of this and his coach Tamara, um, and everyone over there at American iron gym, like they definitely know, um, they, they mess up and, and they're going to redo it. They're going to get better. So you won't have that card again, but you will have Vin probably in your corner. And, um, but I'll tell you what, yeah, it's just going to come down to who's strongest on that day and who's going to make all their attempts. That's what it's going to come down to. Yeah. That's what's going to win worlds. And it's in in every, every meet that I've done before that wasn't an IPF meet that that wasn't the case. You know, it was okay. Who's who's smarter <laughs> with their attempt yeah. selections? And it wasn't always who was strong. But like, but when you're at Worlds, it's just like, dude, you're going up against people who have coaches that coach in meets every weekend. Like, oh yeah, yeah. So and even even we do. You better um, be able to to do a little, you know, tomfoolery if you want to. But on top of that, you got to back it up because if you can't yeah. back it up with, with executing, like you're going to lose, you're not going to get the place you want. Well, so. look at these, look at these countries that you're going against Sweden, Great Britain. The Swedish France. coaches are wizards, dude. <laughs> Swedish are, are the, some of the best in the game. So you're not going to pull any tricks. You're not going to trick anyone at this level. It will be an egregious mistake. If anyone makes a mistake, it will be rare and everyone will be talking about it afterwards. But most of the time, the coaches at this level, they're not making any mistakes. So it'll come down to who's strongest, yeah. who can ex- who can execute their lifts to the standard in front of these IPF refs and jury. Yeah. And that's what I love about worlds, man. That is so, that's so cool because yeah, like at the end of the day, you just have to execute. And if you don't, unless, yeah. unless you put in a temp selection that, that was just blatantly wrong. Like, you know. yeah. Which is rare at this level. So, yeah. but, um, so just we were talking a little bit about worlds there and we got we're going to keep getting sidetracked on different topics and that's great i love it and we will eventually go through like a, exactly the uh you know what what happened and whatnot at at uh in scottsdale like as far as your lifts are concerned we won't go into the strategy stuff but um we'll go into your lifts and whatnot but did you come away after malta happened after the world championship happened and, and looking at the totals that the 93s put up and is that now sort of the target that you're looking for? I think Keiko did 888. And I mean, you're in the neighborhood now. Like you last year going into the world championships, you know, your best totals were just cracking like right around 790s, upper 790s. But then boom, Scottsdale total 818 with Ruben the tank, with pulling, making a 30 kilo jump on your on your last deadlift and, and not needing it to win. So I mean, you definitely are now in that same ballpark of like 850 range ish. Are are you going to start targeting these guys like Keiko and uh, Gavin? And is that the goal next? Yeah. Um, there's some variables that I kind of look at when I'm looking at that stuff. So like how old's yeah. Keiko? Keiko's what, 30? Yeah, something? he's like 30. Yeah. So, and, and, and Gavin's obviously what, two older, two years older than me. Maybe. Yeah, he's pretty young. Yeah. So. And Gavin's what five five. Do you say how tall he is? Six. He's five foot on a good day. No, I'm just, just joking. I don't know how tall he is. He's shorter than me. I'm pretty sure. He's definitely so, shorter than you. 
No, yeah. they, like they both are. They both you know, are like actually. five eight and three quarters or something like yeah, that. Yeah, so, yeah, they're both they're both significantly shorter. I'm not saying that I ha- I don't have the potential with my frame to do that because we can see people like um, Chance Mitchell, mm-hmm. who's uh, silly. I think he's shorter than I am. He definitely is. Yeah. yeah. So it's like I'm twenty three. When my body, I know when my body wants to grow, it's going to grow. I'm not going to hold it back. And I'm not going to waste my entire career trying to stay in a weight class that I have to, making it harder for myself than I actually have to. Now, I don't know what that's going to be like. Because, you know, I think Joe Stanek and and Austin, you know, they've been talking about like ceilings and stuff. And obviously Austin Perkins has been just leveling up. It's like how, you didn't think he can get any stronger than where he was at. It's like, no, I'm going to triple 661 and rp7 like yeah okay (laughs) that's cool (laughs) so and at the same body weight now like i don't know i mean obviously that is the goal like anyone that wants to total closest to nine nine hundred kilos like that's what i want to do but um i don't know i don't know if it's possible i'm not i'm not and whenever i say i'm a very i'm a realist Okay. I don't know where it comes from. Chloe, Chloe tells me that I just, I am a pessimist, but that's not true. Like it's not going to me saying that, Oh, I don't know. Isn't going to impact my effort towards my goal. Okay. I'm just kind of weighing stuff out and yeah, in no way does it have, does it have an effect on, I'm like, yeah, I'm I'm not, I'm just going to go half ass now. Like that's, that's not a thing with me. It never has been. And few people understand that, but I don't know. Cause you know, with me coaching lifters and just understanding and watching all these people evolve into who they are, like Chance put on what, 100, 150, 200 pounds on his total in, in a year. Yeah. And I'm like, how many times is that going to happen to him? How many times is that going to happen to Austin? How many times is that going to happen to me? Yeah. And you look at the circumstances of it and it's so, it's not black and white. And um, so you never know. I don't know. And maybe, maybe, um, I don't know what, I don't know if Chance is still alive, but if Gavin and, um, Kaiko, you know, yeah, Kaiko, if they, what if they hit walls or something, you know, what if they have, what if they have good performances, but if they're at a wall, you know, what if, so you never know. I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, if even like looking the at most of those guys, they're like absolutely. You know, they're the strongest people I've probably ever met and seen. And I think, yeah, I just don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't I mean, know if I have the capabilities to be there, but I'm, I'm definitely going to try. <laughs> well, Keiko, Keiko started lifting competitively, competing in meets when he was around 23 years old. Now he's 30. So, I mean, it's a long game. Like, I think you have a really good head on your shoulders as far as knowing that it's a marathon that, you know, you're, you're going to, it's going to take a while to, you can get that strong. Now you've been competing since you were super young, since you were 15 was your first meet. So, so your training age is up there um, with those yeah. guys, but the biological age also factors in as well. And, you know, I can say like, once you get up to being age around age 30, you're going to be well into the nine hundreds, brother. Like there's no question about that. It's just a matter of when, and if, if the others have also made that same kind of progress, yeah, and who knows? You might probably be a 105. Maybe I'll bench 450 one day. Maybe <laughs> yeah. if I can bench 450, you bet your sweet baby I'm totaling 900 kilos. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Shit, that's where Keiko's got everyone, man. Like benching like 540. What did he do? He did 535 at Worlds. Yeah. Well, that's I mean, insane. did you look at Chance? It's like the not like top of the line squad, amazing deadlift. And I kind of mirror that in a sense. Yeah. And then his bench is like, dude, my bench is going to, is going to tell me whether I'm going to win this world championship or not Mm -hmm. for me right now. And same with him too. I was like, you know, looking at his history and bench press at the time, I was like, if his bench is is high enough, like he can pull, like he's good. Look what happens, you know? So totally, totally. But I don't know. Things change. People change. And that was also a situation with some coaching errors involved as well with the attempt selection, whatnot, which is rare. Like we said, that's why it's a big deal that, that there was coaching errors there because um, usually you don't have coaching errors at that level. So, yeah. Well, another name you mentioned was Alexis Jones. 
And I know, you know, you don't want to step on her story and let her tell her thing whenever she's coming out. But you did mention that she was working on bench depth and I've seen it on her stories and on her Instagram and stuff. How is that going on the bench depth side of things? Yeah, I don't want to speak too much because so there's a lot of things that are kind of undecided in, in yeah. um, kind of our relationship um, coaching, not like if we're going to work together or not, but just there's a lot of things that are kind of going on in her life that are, are um, not concrete yet. So we don't really, gotcha. I don't want to speak too much other than that too. And, you know, I don't know how much she wants to disclose about anything, but however, yeah. her bench depth is doing fine in my opinion. Okay. And um, I will say one thing about Lex Jones is because I've been, coaching her so on and off kind of when she was in Midland I, I had to let you know Tim because they have a policy behind that and yeah. which is totally okay um when when I coached her it was like it was like a switch it was like when you're coaching someone that elite at that point in time it <laughs> you can tell it's like a computer you're programming, you know, you're programming. You're like, okay, there's no doubt in my mind. This is what's going to happen. Like, yeah, I'm going to put this down and she makes it happen. It happens. And a majority of her off season is spent like trying to stay injury free and put pushing things that we don't necessarily always um, not pushing things that we always push in, in season. Cause at, at her body weight and the way she puts up it, it, she's got her things that kind of bother her. So we need to make sure that we're, we're not pushing things, you know, too crazy all the time, but, and, and her RP scale in her head is messed up. That's what I, I'm going to call it right now. She'll, nice. she'll send me like a 550 single and she's like, yeah, this felt like a nine. I was like, dude, you could do that. If I showed you it right now, I'm like, you can do that for easy five reps. Like, okay. So she has though. to that's, be pushed. That's the better side to be on when it comes to RPE. She, uh, like it's, it's so much worse when you see someone like an absolute grind and you know, they could not have lifted a single pound more. And then they're like, Oh, that was RPE seven. You're just like, no, it was not in our, so that's yeah. good. Cause you can, you can push her. It's harder to rein in those, those people that think RPE 10 is actually RPE seven. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, think, been, please. it's been, uh, it's been very interesting getting to know her, her lifter psychology I, I guess you could put it as yeah and and you know when I tell him like hey you better you better go like we need to do this like it's so cool to see that like that just intensity switch with that girl is absolutely insane I'm like yep yeah, not worried about it I can put yeah. down attempts and I'm like she doesn't even have to ask me what it is I'm like you better get this and then like it's almost like yeah, it's just so cool. How powerful that girl is, is absolutely insane. She's such a good athlete. So cool. Um, so we're excited to, to see what happens. So you said that you were watching, watching the world championships, like specifically this weight class, 84 plus. I mean, I can't wait as well. Like I've met her in Orlando. She was in the audience. So I got to shake her hand and everything like that. You could tell she's a star, like she's going to be a future star. I can't wait if or when or whatever i wish only the best things for her but if she comes over i can't wait to just like help her like blow up her social media try to get her more sponsors and just you know get her make her into the superstar that she deserves to be um because i think she gets slept on kind of a lot um right now and but you said you were watching the world championships in this weight class in particular how exciting was it i mean it was like this is some ridiculous numbers like I didn't think that anyone would get that close to her number. Cause what did she total? 701. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I didn't, I honestly thought that people would be totaling like maybe like 690 at the most, or maybe like 688 or something in that range, like six, maybe even 685 could have won it at worlds, but no, here comes Brittany Schlater with a 693.5 with some room in the tank. What did you mm -hmm. So, so, I mean, are you excited about the, what the future could possibly hold for this weight class? I mean, it's exciting. Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> hold on a second. I'm pulling something up. Yeah. So. Four weeks and, out. 
from uh, USAPL Nationals. Yeah. So, I mean, just look out for that meet and see what kind of total she puts up. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping we actually get her to do a number in the end where we're like, I don't think I could have put any more on that total. I think because she has yet to do a meet like that. It's like, uh, I've yeah. seen Lex struggle. I've seen Lex struggle in the gym training her. Like, actually come close to failure. And I was like, the only thing that she actually even came close to failure on at, at the last meet she did was her squat, was mm-hmm. a 600. So, and she's more than that now. Easy. Yeah, yeah. No, I can't wait, dude. Like, I, I like that... because the training that we're seeing right now, her do. I'm like, I'm like, bro. <laughs> I'm like, Lex, look at this. Like, this is cool. So we're excited. She tends to blow up in the summertime, right? When you, when you're coaching her and everything like that, and she's got a little time off of competing because I know Midland, they got to go compete a, kind of a lot and stuff. Mm-hmm. And there's not a lot of time to build, but man, this, this weight class used to be one where you would just be like, Bonico going to win it. It's boring. Yeah. It's yeah. over. And then ever since we've been hearing the whispers of Lex Jones and what she might, the potential might be in the future. And then now we got Sonita coming from Belgium. And now Brittany Schlater has like, just put on a ton oh. onto her total. And she's a great person and super nice person. Yeah, in the sport. absolutely. Super strong. So, so strong and like blowing up her total. I mean, she, you know, she was at five sixty not long ago. Like she put up a five sixty total, like in 2022, a low 600s total you know, in 2021. And now she's at 693. So like this weight class is just one of the most exciting. And I think throwing Lex into that is mix is just going to be so fun and it's going to be so exciting. So, and one last thing about her too, is that Lex needs, she needs a direct source of motivation in that moment. Okay. And on the platform by herself, you know, at nationals beforehand, there's no one within sight. There's not even anyone in the, in, in the United States at the time, you know, it's just like, I cannot wait for the moment where it's like bars loaded. If you don't get this, you're going to (laughs) lose, you know, like she's never had that in her head before where everything was on the line. She's never been to the point where like, if you don't put everything on the line right now on every single attempt, she's never been there before. So but knowing how she is, I'm excited to see how that will be. Because that's how I work best. That's where a lot of lifters will work best. Some will crumble, but like, you know, it's just that's what I'm makes excited. that's what makes it a sport, man. Like that that's exactly. honestly what, what makes, makes it a sport. sport. If you show up and there's no chance you can lose and you can win with openers, whatever, that's not really a sport. That's like an exhibition, you know. It's like it has to be like on any given Sunday. Doesn't matter if you're the worst team in the league or the best team in the league, you could lose. It, yeah. you, you know in, and if you don't have that then you don't there's no nothing exciting there's no drama um you don't really get to experience the highest level and the fun of what it means to like come out on top after a big battle like that and uh, on the flip side too like sometimes it takes experiencing those defeats and those close like coulda shoulda woulda moments well oh man we could have had two and a half more here and that would have won it for us on body weight or whatever that fuels you for the whole next, next off season where you can, you know, push yourself again. And so, yeah, you need that kind of stuff. Obviously we have the numbers in our sport where that are comparable, where you can say, Hey, I did 701 and you did 693. That's, that's something, but it's a matter of doing it in that same platform with the battle that just, it's fun. Yeah. Man. It just, it's, it's like at that point in time, your totals don't even matter. It's like, yeah, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't at all. Yeah. It's, it's just, it's based off the last attempt that you did and versus the next person. It totally. doesn't even matter what, oh, I totaled 740 and I totaled 716. So obviously you're not going to win. Cause I'm, I mean, I'm not going to win. Yeah. Because it's like, no. It's like, what if that person misses their second attempt on squat and they have to retake it and now they're down 20 kids? It's like, yeah, you know, crazy. So, so tell us a little bit about your like lifting history and your background and take us all the way up to uh, Scottsdale here. So like, I'm just looking at your open power thing, man, dude, you've been competing since you were 15 years old. Earlier That's than wild. that, actually, um, in unsanctioned meets. So, um, let me pull it up too, really quick. So I give you some accurate and just, just to walk through. So I'm not skipping through a bunch of stuff, but, and I'm, yeah. I'm not, I'm going to try to summarize it as much as possible too. Yeah, of course. Um, Cause we got some spicy stuff to talk about at the end. 
powerlifting news. Oh man. So okay. So we got Michigan annual no frills qualifier. That was my first meet. I actually um for the US APL. Before that, that was 2016. I was competing since 20 late 2014, I believe it was. Um wow. and through US um MHSPLA, so Michigan Powerlifting High School Powerlifting Association. I did uh, multiple meets and I've done um way more meets than what's on open powerlifting um because that's all, that's not crazy. sanctioned but to standard i would say 100 percent because i you know i, I did lift in usapl and, and mhspla at the time so it was kind of like ths yeah yeah SPA, but for some you know, reason the Michigan, it's kind of the for, same thing we have our own go ahead yeah yeah but for some reason they don't put their their results in yeah, um, because I'm pretty sure it's all done on a spreadsheet, never shared, because it's all just private funding, really. It's just funding for <laughs> schools. Um, but, you know, we kind of revolutionized it after I started competing in the USAPL, and then a bunch of other people started following, and my actual, my high school team created a USAPL um, um, high school team to go to high school nationals, and we actually okay. attended the first Raw high school nationals and usapl at the time um but anyway i've been lifting before that um i was like 163 pounds it looks like so i lifted equipped for two years um i don't know if many people know that but i did um mm -hmm. and that's how i met austin Perkins in 20 i think 2016 um it would have been 2017 oh, wow. yep um so it's single ply 165 i went up against austin perkins he won that year he went to worlds and lost and then we re re, re reconnected at midland years later and that's wow. how, yeah so a lot of people don't know that either but yeah we have pictures of us on the platform and stuff and that's um, wild dude and, yeah. and even austin seems like such a new like I, I guess i know he's been around like he's been at top level since like 2019 and before but i mean that's even crazy to think oh you guys are seriously ogs like anyone that's been around since 2016 2017 isn't 2016 like around the time when they first started doing raw in the IPF or was that 2014? Was it so just, I'm not sure in the that? IPF because I, I yeah. didn't lift in the IPF. Um, yeah. I never made it. Um, but yeah, I believe, I believe like, so. it might've been earlier. I think it was around 2014 or something like that. Maybe that 2012. Too. Um, yeah. but yeah, at the time I was just looking at, but because I was equipped at the time. So, um, and then from there, you know, let's see here bunch of qualifying meets my first raw meet ever was um rochester hills barbell on that was 2017 um and that's where i met all of the famous or most known michigan people now um in powerlifting and usapl and, and pa i met all of them we've been really good friends like jeremy and worm i don't know if anyone knows that or if you do but um either way um i did that that was my first raw meet I tried to I tried to go from six or 584 to 650 on deadlift and um my grip failed me twice. So for some reason I thought I was good for 700 at when I was that age. So uh, <laughs> well you got it at the next meet. I did. <laughs> so you were good for it. Yeah. As an 83. Um, that was Raw Nationals. That was my first national championship. I had won that. There was a big space in there between 20. 18 competing because i broke my leg um and okay. that's that's from the unreal meet to um i was supposed to go to raw nationals in 2017 as well and then i broke my leg and then um i didn't compete again until i think raw nationals or no i did i did that unreal meet and then i qualified went to raw nationals i came back and finally hit um i don't know i missed 701 there too so when did you break your leg and what, what, what happened to break your leg? Cause I actually remember this, this is actually crazy. Like one of my, you're one of the first, first people, people that I followed on Instagram. Um, and I remember you had like just broken your leg. So that tells you around the time when I started paying attention, I guess that was around no way. 2017, 2018. Really? Yeah. I remember it because I found someone sent it, sent you to me or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that was and my I, leg. All I must I dislocated it, broke my fibula. For people who don't know what fibula is, it's just the side leg bone, uh, most lateral on the outside. Basically, my my foot knocked it off, and it's very common for people who dislocate laterally or externally um, to knock 
the talus, the bone of your foot knocks that off. So um, I was playing football and I ended up tackling someone spinning around and then my leg was behind me and I fell on my own leg and that's what dislocated it. And then um, just a little bit, I felt it crunch and the guy landed on top of me. And I believe that's when it went all the way around and then it broke my fibula off. And I heard that too. That was terrible. Felt it. Um, Dude, I'm cringing inside. Oh so man. Hard. But it, yeah, but it's crazy though. Like the adrenaline you have the first two minutes, you don't really feel anything. And you know, I don't know. I'm weird. I'm thinking about like when people like have traumatic injuries, like, you know, say someone i know this is terrible someone gets shot like they probably don't it's probably like the same thing if i just had my my leg almost ripped off and not really felt anything like you think about like something else traumatic that's crazy what our bodies can do but uh, oh, yeah. but yeah after i mean the most excruciating pain i've ever been in, ever so and it still is to this day i still remember it afterwards and uh, but yeah Damn, that's bro. that's what happened i did break my leg. Yeah. i was sad because i think were you committed to midland at that point no so i actually wasn't i had the meeting uh, like two weeks later and okay. i called tim uh like a week later after i got my surgery and i go hey tim like uh i'm in you know i'm i'm in the hospital um i was in the hospital like a week ago or whatever i uh, just got surgery and they're not telling they're telling me it's going to be a while and i don't know how my recovery is going to be i don't know if my career's over i gotta because this is terrible like I, I couldn't walk for a couple couple months and um he's like yeah i believe in you you gotta drive so we'll sign you and that was when the team was really small and i was like damn that that's crazy that he he still did that yeah and, um, that was something i never took for granted going through midland it was almost like i had something to prove and um that was like that was like a theme of my life for a long time to say, yeah i gotta have something to prove i gotta prove myself worthy because i'm like dude that that injury like took a lot out of me mentally um at the time i'm way past it now it's not even like a thought in my mind anymore but because yeah. I, I never tasted success i was so close i was so close i was always the top guy i was so close and then it was like it's like you know it's like does god hate me <laughs> yeah. and then yeah. once i started tasting success i was like you know motivations change different you, know, you kind of go into the sport and, and each meet differently and um, even today it's changed from what it was my last meet. So, um, in, in terms of discipline and motivation and passion for the sport. Um, but before it was, it was solely like, like, I have to do this because this is like, you know, this is what, this is, this is the big goal. Like I haven't even done, I haven't even want uh, my biggest goal ever in my life at the time was like, I want to win a national championship, but yeah. And since then I've won a, a few. So, um, yeah. I mean, you were the deadlift nut. Like someone, yeah. sent me, someone sent me in there, like, here's this like 17, 16 year old kid, whatever age you were. And I'm like, God damn, like I should just give up in life. Like, because this guy's like already pulling like a house. And, um, and then the, like, it was like, right. Like right whenever I first started following you, it was like, you broke your leg, like right after that. And I was like, damn, like this guy had all the potential in the world. And then I remember the whole Midland thing still happened and everything. And I was a big fan because I was from, I was, from Omaha, Nebraska. And so it I was told always, me, yeah, that's when I, I met you a, around that time. Yeah. And so I was always a fun, I was always a fan and I was always trying to like run into like Midland lifters, like wherever I would see them or whatever, you know? And so, yeah, no, it was, it was, it was cool to see the comeback story and all that stuff, but man, I felt for you because especially being a big deadlifter, it's like, you need your legs, you know, it wasn't like you could just like practice benching and get a huge chest or something in the meantime. Um, but yeah, it was, yeah, that, that was, was it was heartbreaking, man. And to see it happen to someone so young when you when your identity is already tied up into something like you're the deadlift guy, right? I, I could see and I was older, you know, I was probably like 35, whatever at that time. And so I was like, you know, I was able to see, I was like, damn, this could be a make or break situation for this kid, you know, and then you, of course, came out of it, became a, a, a good upstanding young man, graduated college, now you're coaching everything. So it all turned out okay. Yeah, it was, I was very, very, very passionate about it. I mean, my entire life revolved around it. And yeah, it's, it's not that I'm not passionate about now, but I'm like, I'm growing up now. And it's like, it's like goals change, you know, um, a lot. And the drive, it comes from a different place. And, but yeah, back then, dude, I was just like, I was like, for me to be able to, as, traumatic as that injury didn't necessarily sound or but by the pictures but it was very uh it sucked it, yeah. and i still have to deal 
with it. I still have to deal with it every day um, because it was, um, yeah, it it was pretty traumatic. But anyway, um, for me to be able to to do what I did, that wouldn't have been possible if I didn't have that drive. Like, Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have been been able to do any meet the way that I did after um, winning my first national championship after that because I still had something to prove I still I was like dude this is so behind but like I kind of matured and grew up and realized I'm like you know yeah. this is where I'm at now and what you know what are I'm moving for what, what are my new goals so and kind of getting into the juniors was that was like turning the page after Midland I was like what can I do as a junior now you know mm-hmm. independently and after that i'm also turning the page this year too so it's like another transition thing yeah getting married opens yeah going into open and and um just you're just becoming a more well-rounded person like human being like where you're not not. just a big deadlifter and that's it like now you're a husband you're a coach you know like you're so many more dog dad for lord sake (laughs) (laughs) absolutely you're a co-pilot with dak over here on his bourbon trials and yeah you gotta get you gotta oh, get yeah yeah so there's a lot more to you now so but um but going through this uh open powerlifting like tell us about the midland years the midland years okay so i guess we can start with uh Raw Nationals. So technically that wasn't Collegiate Nationals, but we still went as a team to Raw Nationals. Um, This is my first year, my first fall um, of college. Um, And that looks like it was October. Yeah. Um, 2018. Yeah. And I was Raw Team 3. I was 18 at the time. Wow. 83, too. I'm reading the wrong thing. Our nationals. I was 18 at the time. Oh, that makes it. That doesn't seem right. Okay. So um, <laughs> time flies. So 83, um, I ended up squatting 574. Um, I believe that was the current American record. Um, that was Ashton Ruska's um, American record in that weight class for team, for the team division. A Raider now has that. Um I ended up benching 330 and then missing 701. Um, that was a relatively um, – Antonino Fazio, which is now a uh, bench god in the USAPL, he was my competition at that meet. Um, and uh, I ended up clutching that, and that was that was awesome. That was my first meet. Now going to first collegiate national is probably like the most historic one, in my opinion, yeah. which a lot of people kind of got introduced to me is me against Ben Poor at USAPL collegiate nationals. Yeah, that's right. Um, Going into that meet, um, it's my first collegiate meet, and, you know, fired up, ready to go. Squat was terrible. And obviously, as you can see, I went 545 to 584, and then after that, I was like, that was like a max. So I took 595 because I was like, I'm going to take what I can. Realistically speaking, should have scratched that. Um, Going into it, I did – I think that meet I ended up squatting around the same weight about 600 606 for single so I was like I'm good but no my I I peaked terribly and bench was amazing huge huge jump from you know a couple months ago yeah um, 22 pounds and then um Ben Poor and I he gave me my first experience as like a competitive power lifter um, obviously he was, he was three years, two years older or something like that. Two and a half years older than me. Um, one of the strongest 183s in, in, in history at the time. And, um, he, um, we were going at it on deadlift attempts and I think I was pulling the 717 that was chipped because I think it was for the win for, for one. And it was the, um, I think it was the open world record at 83, um, the open world record, which doesn't wow. make sense, but I'm pretty sure that was the, open world record he was either open or junior but i'm pretty sure it was the open wow. and uh at that time um which is nothing now because now there's 83s pulling almost 800 over 800 pounds so yeah um so after that what is this show of strength upa yeah, oh that was a super crazy upa meet in here oh bro i did a money meet uh that's the show of strength is now actually uh that was my first rap meet so that one is um that is uh now 
Is it the Ed, Ed Cohen? Ed Cohen classic meet. Yeah, that's what so it turned into. That's so Omaha that's why I met Ed Cohen. I was like fanboying like crazy. And yeah, I just did a rap meet. I went to a deadlift bar meet, still failed 7 Eleven. So I don't know what happened there. Um, won two grand, though. That was awesome. Or something that's like that. Weird. It was a lot of money at the time. Um, then Estonia. Omaha, so, Omaha yeah, dude. My favorite gym on the planet, 100%. Um, still is, always will be, I'm pretty sure um estonia you know that was uh the world cup for us injured so i only squatted 551 um i think i placed fourth or something like that yeah, fifth it's a, it's a, i placed fifth um but i was trying to you know it, i definitely squat up to six and that would have put me in top two i think what won that meet um and that that's also the meet that austin perkins blew up because he pulled um put up the open world records on the squat and i think yeah. the deadlift as well um so and then yeah i did absolutely terrible on deadlift don't know what happened so that was the worst meet of my life <laughs> which was my first international meet okay. um Let so that's that why it was also one of the greatest times of my life because after the after losing like that i was like all right i need to de-stress we're all just gonna have fun and enjoy this because everything else sucked it was the worst meet of my life. yeah <laughs> Um, collegiate nationals. So that was my second national championship, um, for collegiates. I, that, where was that? Washington. I ended up going up against, um, I think the same guy, um, Ben poor again or no, Oh, and Antonino Fazio. I went up against him. Um, did amazing. I don't know how I missed 551 on, I don't even remember missing 551. Uh, I think it was just depth. And then um, we went up like a couple kilos for whatever reason. And then I, my end game obviously would be around 600, six something because it, it's been some time. And then yeah, ben, 352, just a little, I think that matched. And then I finally got my first 706 pound deadlift, first, first 700 deadlift in a meet ever. And then, um, that was huge for me. That was monumental. And then also my first collegiate national championship. And then after that, we go into uh, collegiate junior nationals. This is my favorite meet of all time. This was in Louisiana. Um, I was 20 at the time, 205. I weighed in at 9, 196. I just moved up. I had a crazy growth spurt. I ended up squatting 622 with change, um, 380 on bench with some change, um, probably like half a pound change. And I ended up pulling 750. And I, that's when I beat Hayden Willis for that meet there um awesome. my first nine for nine meet um yeah 795 total that is to date one of the best meets. yeah um my it, i don't know <laughs> i, I want to replicate that meet as much as possible at that point i was like that felt good i was yeah. like I, that was a that was a super meet um and was tim that was that tim anderson co coaching and calling numbers yeah, actually, it was Donovan Thompson, but yeah, they both do at the same time, depending mm -hmm. on the situation. I was the last lifter of the entire flight for the entire day, so everyone was going in. All the Nori and Flex coaches were trying to team up on the other side, and, and um, yeah, you know, do what they could for the other people, even though they didn't coach them. But you know, it was good. Um, I still call. I still. I still say that out loud on podcasts because I, I just don't understand. That's fine. But anyway. Um, nothing against them personally. Um, and then, you know, what else do we have? It's always funny though. Like a situation like that, you remember those things. Oh, and it you wasn't, know what first, I mean? yeah, it wasn't the first time, but <laughs> yeah. yeah, it just sucks. Cause I was like, dang, I was like, you're fighting, you're fighting on a different team. And this guy doesn't, he doesn't even know you like, <laughs> yeah, you just want to see me lose. I always want to see you, me lose, but you won anyway. They want to see me they, most a, a couple of people in mine also wanted to see me lose at, at uh, this past nationals. Is that right? Um, and then that, yeah, that was it. That was at the end of my collegiate career because I only did three years. I finished college early. I got out. Um, and, um, what a way to end it. And, and, and that talk about like intent and stuff because you know that was my last meet at collegiates and arguably one of the greatest three-year spans of my lifetime and 
Um, yeah. met, you know, my wife there, some of the greatest friends I ever had the best experiences and was in a really good community. And I was like, you know, I had everything on the line there. I was like, this is it. My name is going to go down in history as either losing this meet and doing terrible or I'm going to go nine for nine and it's going to go crazy. And that's what I did. So envisioning that was huge because it was like every day I woke up and I was like, I had goals on the wall and you know, I just knew what I was going into. I was so well prepared mentally. And I was just, when you're in, when you're in Midland, you're in such an isolated powerlifting full-time community. It's almost like powerlifting's first and then, you know, school comes second. Yeah. Um, but you have enough free time to do that. So, yeah. That's like, that's what it feels like to be like a pro athlete in a way, you know, where it's like, yeah. it's like, yeah, I've got some other things on my calendar, but really like I'm only focused on this, at least for a short period of time. Um, I know college undergrad days are like the best memories, man. Like you always look back on them, like the most fondly, um, because that's, that's kind of like your first time, like out of the house. And like, you, you go through growing up together with people that are the same age as you and everything like that. And you make lifelong friends. You met your wife, you met your couple of homies to the, to, you know, ride or die homies like Austin and Lex and other people there. And I know she came after, she came after you and everything, but you kind of have that similar uh, connection with her because of all, all mm -hmm. that stuff. And yeah. you always have those ties back with Midland, like wherever direction they ultimately go or whatever. It's like, you'll always be like one of the OG veterans, like who put them on the map, you yeah. know? And so it's cool, man. You, you're, you're, your legacy, legacy will always be sort of tied back into Midland at some point. Yeah. And I think it's also cool. Cause like you said, it's, it's Fremont, Nebraska. It's like Nowhereville, USA. Um, and even Pretty now, you live in, and now you're living in India and stuff, but like you can be happy in these small towns and, and like, it's good. It's a good fit for you, you know, for sure. Because I know for the Nebraska football team, trying to recruit guys away from like Miami or from LA to come out to Lincoln, Nebraska, it's tough. It's really tough, you know? And so, but we every now and then you find the right kind of personality like yourself that can be like a country boy living out in Fremont wearing cowboy boots and playing the guitar. <laughs> yeah, dude. I, yeah. I, like, I come from a town of like 7,000. You go to Fremont, yeah. like 40,000 people are like, this is small. This is blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah. where are you from? Are you from a yeah. different planet, dude? Cause <laughs> yeah. I was like, this is massive. <laughs> it's all relative, you know, it's all yeah. relative to where you come from and stuff, you know? So it's just really cool you got a good head on your shoulders, good upbringing and everything to make the most out of that, of that whole situation that sure. you went through. And after coming off the injury and all that, um, and then the battles that you had, and then just a, the sweet taste of victory. So that's cool, man. All right. Then take us into your PA days. Then it's, uh, Orlando. Those are great days. So we got, we got, we got really? Orlando. It's actually labeled as, EMP, which is weird. I didn't know that that was. Yeah, it's uh, I because um, powerlifting American Australia, powerlifting. powerlifting Australia has PA, uh, and they were in the books before, so they had to come up with something. So I guess gotcha. it's American powerlifting. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense as long as people know. Okay, so uh, nationals last year, man, that was crazy. So, um, going into that meet, you know, twenty-two years old, uh, Wayne's still pretty light. I was like 201, it looked like. You had two years off. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, that is common for me. Um, I don't – oh, because of the whole split and everything. I didn't know what yeah. I wanted to do, but I still knew that I was top ranked. So I was like, I want to go to IPF. That was like my dream, man. And it was everyone's dream before it split. And now everyone gaslights each other and thinking yeah. that it's not. And it's terrible. It's a terrible thing. I'm like, so just stick to your guns. If you still want to go to the IPF, do it. Don't tell, don't let your people tell you like, Oh, it's blah, 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 blah. That was yeah. terrible. Um, um, anyway, I, I took two years off, I guess, uh, totally almost. So that was rough for everyone because no one, you know, was trying to get qualified me, trying to do this, trying to do that. And, um, not really aligning with my goals. All I knew was like, okay, dude, I'm just going to eat and I'm just going to keep working hard. I'm just going to keep putting on muscle as much as possible. Cause I made my debut. I'm like, I gotta be beefy, bro. I can't, <laughs> I, can't <laughs> I can't come in soft. So, um, yeah, I was just ready. Cause I was like, I, my last meet was a high, you know, from yeah. going from the collegiate. Yeah. I was like my next, my next debut. I'm like, uh, in the PA, I'm like, I'm like, I got I got a lot to live up to, but I'll tell you. 
tell you what, there was even at that time and even today, there's there is not an environment or the energy or the the amount of sacrifices that I've made towards powerlifting like it was when I won nationals in Louisiana. My life has yeah. not been the same since then. And that's not to say because I'm like doing less work for it, but it's just like you grow up, you know, you can do powerlifting full time to a certain extent, but I mean, if you want to value other areas of your life too, you have to you have to you know, yeah. you have to water that garden too. It's so. not going to be like it was in college when you can no. just wake up every no. day and think about powerlifting only. And that's it. Like now you're a real adult with real responsibilities, man, but that's all we did, dude. And, um, but yeah, Those so going into that, I was like, you know, I worked, I worked really, really hard and people ask me why I don't do a whole lot of meets. And it's because the reason why I don't do a whole lot of meets is because there's other areas in my life now that I really like to, you know, I'm really family oriented. Obviously see I'm 23 and I'm married and um, yeah. you know, I, I do my business and stuff and I like to grow with that as well. And, and it's demands, but, um, I, I can't dedicate the entirety of my life to powerlifting. So I dedicate a, a certain amount of time that is, is spent doing what is necessary to maintain and maybe progress a little bit. And then going to the extreme as we get closer to meets and and closer and closer and closer, I have to start making sacrifices in my personal life, business, and stuff like that in order for me to be stress-free and, and completely orient my life towards powerlifting and, and its goals and, and make sure that you know, I'm doing what I can. Um, and that's just personally how I deal with it. I know other people have different lives and they have different coping ways of doing things and, and, yeah. and balancing and stuff, but there really is no balance. I mean, it's just you're either going to water this side of the garden or the other. Yeah. You got, you got one, you got one tank of water. So, um, and that's how I view it. So, um, anyway, going back into, I know I'm kind of going on. It's good. No, ahead, these but, insights are good, man. We, yeah. everyone wants to know what the elite level athletes are thinking about, like what your mindset is about. This not athlete. always powerlifting. I would say so this is great. Very, this is like the most chill powerlifting has ever been in my entire life. It's the most backseat it's ever been, but there's a lot of things that, I've integrated in my lifestyle for so long that I don't necessarily have to work for like diet and sleeping and, mm -hmm. you know, not every once in a while, you, you know, when I'm coming up to meet and stuff, I do have to make sure my stress levels are low because I can't go into a training session thinking about blah, 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 blah. Like, like yeah. if your head's not in it, you're not going to get a whole lot of your training. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I've just been really trying to, you know, there's, there's certain opportunities that arose within my life at the time that I had to take hold of that, you know, I'm like, you know, and, and, and I hate to say this, but at one point in time, I wasn't even thinking about going to Worlds this year because of, of certain circumstances, but I, you know, it, it's taken a lot of sacrifice, um, I think, mentally to be able to do this. And I mean, people, people would take that how it is, because I mean, obviously, I'm not going to tell everyone my personal life. And I know yeah. Anthony's kind of going through the same thing right now, too. Yeah. And he said that I'm only saying that publicly because he said it publicly, but yeah, you know, we're just growing up and we're just, there's, there's things that are kind of taking precedence over powerlifting. And it sucks because, you know, powerlifting is, is people view me and they see me like, Oh, you're a powerlifter. You know, that's the thing, yeah. but it's not like that anymore. It's like, to me, I'm like in my head, I'm like, I'm doing so many other things. And, you know, I want to hold on to that passion as much as possible and it will never go away. It's just, I know it's just a season and it will pass, but yeah. Um, but anyway, it gives you, it also gives, that's some really good insight too. And like, when you look at someone like Keiko as well, who's like doing it now into his thirties, it's like, there might have been years in there where he wasn't on his game as a hundred percent as he is now. And he's just now it. engaged. Yeah, exactly. So like so his he, life's you know, going to change as well too. And, and yeah. Aspects we probably won't see. And we, and he talked about that a lot too, like having priorities about other okay. aspects of his life and stuff like this as well. Yeah. So, so, I mean, it's, everyone goes through this and yeah, it's just exactly. about like how you deal with it and do you continue to stack, you yeah. know, do you find little ways here and there where you can still make gains and, and, and add on to your total while balancing that other stuff, mm -hmm. you know? And you can't use it as a crutch or an excuse. You just have to use it as an expectation for yourself because that's where it starts to become very unhealthy. Um, for for people and athletes i think is when they you know i have to go do this in my life i have to do that and now i'm not reaching this goal and it sucks and i'm like 
Yeah. And something I struggle with too. I'm like, you know, that's just the way it is. You made this, these decisions and this is just where it's at right now. And, you know, just be happy with it. And, and as long as you're not sandbagging in any area, at least you can walk out of it with a result of, I did everything I possibly could without going crazy to do this. So um, that's kind of, that's kind of my thing going into worlds right now <laughs> is uh, uh, really quick, but before I get into, into, you know, what's going on right now, but um, mm. Turkey was pretty flawless, man. I mean, I, I hit a PR and then I ended on the squat and then travel was fine. Squat felt amazing. Best squat had felt in a long time. I pulled up 661. It moved really easy in the meet. 391 hit a first, first time PR in about a couple of years. And then um, let's see, well, you know, just a little bit over 385. I think it looks like I took 380 at nationals a year. Um, and then deadlift was absolutely terrible. I tore my hand open on, I, I bumped up. This is my fault. I changed my attempt selection on deadlift because I wanted position, but that was an experiencing that I wasn't really ready for because I was trying to coach myself and not trusting, you know, John and the other guys. And I totally should have, because I, I think the result would have been a little bit different. I probably would have been top three if I didn't mess around so much. Um, but I ended up frying myself. And on top of that, my calluses on both uh, my right hand tore terribly. And then two on two or three on my left. Um, and at that point, it was like bleeding. The right one was really deep. And I went to go pull it again on my third. And it was just wasn't there. I don't even know what that would have got me place wise. Probably, probably first or second. So um, yeah. at the time of the sequence. So. That's that's something that's changed, obviously, because you go into now, which was classic juniors, mm -hmm. uh, our meet that we just did in Scottsdale. Um, let's go into squat really quick. You're going to see a 600 to 640 to 672. That's kind of I feel like that's a weird spread for for some people um, in terms of attempt selection. But again, for me, by the time I took 600, I knew what I was going to be able to do that day for sure. By 640, I knew that. And then mm -hmm. bench had the best bench of my life. Um, felt amazing. Still played it conservative, but it was it was fantastic. And then going into deadlift, obviously we have um, six seventy two is lower than what I took at Worlds uh, like almost a year ago, um, yeah. and that was more of a learning lesson. It's like I make sure I save energy on deadlift because at that point in time I didn't really understand that deadlift. Um, had uh, squats and bench had that big of an impact, but since then I've, I've made training changes and I also um, have more of a preference to what I have to do in order to win and, um, you know, safely take attempts. So, so yeah, smarter opener, yep. 672, then jump up to 734. Yep. So, and then after that, it's just like, what do you have left? So what do you want to mm -hmm. do? Yeah, um, and you, and then Peyton pulled before you, was it? Or no, he pulled after you. Um, Man, Peyton pulled. I think he pulled after you. Pulled after I did. Yeah, because there, yes. there was something that was wrong there. So I think what he had was he had a uh, must have had the higher lot number. So then once they allowed you to go out for 365, it was over. Like he had to take 365 or higher. That's what I think was what happened. No, I think really. I thought he put it in. Okay. I thought I thought Chloe put in the 365. I think what That's happened crazy. was I think what happened was they messed up their second attempt. And then after that, I don't think they could do the math in time for them to actually figure out what they needed to pull to win. But since I had already pulled 804, I don't think they knew that they could change their attempt. Okay. I don't remember exactly. It was a crazy session. There was other shit going on. I think this might have been or the same session know. Lane yeah. was in. I can't remember. I'm pulling it up. I'm pulling up his numbers right now. He did uh he did 332, 242, and then the attempt on 365. I'm I'm like 99% sure that it was uh Chloe had put in a high number and then he had a higher lot number and couldn't change, couldn't go down. Oh. I think that's what it was. But anyway. But none, nonetheless, you both missed. It was kind of a, a 
really interesting strategy. We'll have to go for people listening to this on our YouTube account. We've got the press conference with you and Chloe afterwards. And so Chloe talks, talks you through the strategy a little bit. So if you want, if you're curious about how the game day strategy played out in this one, go back and watch that press conference. I've actually made a playlist for, I think it's called like junior worlds or junior sub junior world, something like that has all the the stuff on there from all of our press conferences in Scottsdale and all the press conferences that we did with any of the juniors that went to opens or any of the other places. So go check that out if you want to hear the final details, but, but yeah, I mean, let's just leave it with hats off to Chloe. Great game day coaching, great attempt selection, but you came away with a big total PR. You came away with your best bench ever, your best squat ever. Um, your deadlift, I mean, you pulled 333 and your best ever is 340. So you probably could have chipped, you could have easily done 345 instead of trying to pull for 365. Yeah, I think I definitely believed I had a winning pull in there. Yeah, exactly. So you could have had a PR, you could have PR at all three lifts yeah. on that yeah. day, which is pretty sick, man. I mean, like, because you went the previous year, I mean, going all the way back to that uh, university or college Nats in, uh, in New Orleans, you were stuck at like 795, 796, 795 in Turkey, 795 in Turkey, 796 in Orlando, 795 in New Orleans. And then now boom, 818 with, like you said, a lot more there on the deadlift. If you needed it, it could have been 830, 840 range. Yeah. There was just a lot of tweaks, a lot of performance tweaks. And it wasn't necessarily like, I did get stronger, but like, there's a lot more that kind of went into that too. So, and it, it's still, I mean, at Worlds, I'm looking to have just a better meet than I did at in Scottsdale at Nationals. And if you look at Nationals, obviously, I only missed one attempt, so I want to win. You know, yeah. like that's all I want to do. But I'm I'm going to follow my guidelines as much as possible, and and see, you know. I'm just going to put it all out there. I've gone way too far and done way too much just to keep worrying about stuff. And I'm like, I'm just going to go out and do it. And whatever happens, happens. And that's powerlifting. But yeah, you know, I do have, I do have a, a certain way of things that I'm a certain um, list of things that I want to do um, particularly in each attempt to, you know, to hit and also how to get those numbers. But, you know, I definitely want to win. So. All right. Well, we won't reveal too much more. Um, let's get into some more fun topics real quick, and I'll let you go. We've been going for damn near two hours already. Oh wow! Uh, which is crazy. We let's we keep it to uh, let's keep it because I actually I just someone no. was calling me. I hate to put this okay. on the podcast, but yeah, um, I have like a thing I have to go do. But anyway, let's keep it. Let's do one more thing because I'm yeah I didn't realize we could talk for two hours. Yeah, dude, we've been doing we've been doing it super fast. Yeah. Let me hit you with these quick hitters that I ask everybody. Yeah. Um. What do you, do you have a day job? Quick hitters. Yeah. Uh, you lucked out. Do you have a day job? Uh, coaching. <laughs> yeah. Coaching. All right. And where do you train? I train at the warehouse gym in Franklin, Indiana. Very small thousand square foot facility. All right. And where'd you grow up? You mentioned Michigan. What's the town? Uh, I grew up um, half my, you know, half my life I up until this point, I, I grew up in Illinois. Um, and then when I was 10, I moved to Michigan. I grew up, I would say this is where I actually my hometown is in Ionia, Michigan. So. All right. And what was your first sport? Uh, my first sport was, I don't know, what was it? Soccer or football? I got, I got cut from the eighth grade basketball team. And then I think I chose to do, was it football? I think I did football first. It was either football or track first. I don't remember which one came first. So, all right. What's your idea of a good time if you're not doing powerlifting? Like, if you could just take a weekend off of life from real life, what would you do? Playing guitar. <laughs> nice. Just hanging out with friends. I'm like I said, pretty family family oriented. I'm doing anything, hanging out. I'm I'm really outdoorsy. I like pretty much doing anything outdoors. So I was gonna say, sitting around a campfire, singing a song. Hunting, fishing, playing guitar, yeah, pretty much. That's and my along favorite. along those lines, are you more of a beer drinker or are you more of a bourbon guy? I like both, um, but I would definitely say that I'm more of a beer guy. I don't, I don't hunt bourbon like everyone 
that you know dakota i have access to some of the like the most rarest bourbons in the world that some people didn't even know exist or blah 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 just because of him because that's his thing you know to us it's powerlifting to him it's bourbon so like that's what he does his entire life kind of revolves around it but no for me yeah definitely i'm a beer guy um on if i'm just drinking a drink i'll drink but if i'm doing an occasion where we want to actually go and drink bourbon and try these things sure but yeah for the most part i'll drink beer shout out dak trying to get you into the bourbon game yep but um all right do you have a nickname um what do people call you like what what are your friends my mom calls me knucklehead (laughs) 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 no i'm just kidding uh I don't like when people refer to me as a deadlift nut because, like, it's just social media thing. But I yeah. get it. Some people, that's all they know about me. No, most people just call me Shane. Shane, got you. Um, what's your favorite sport to watch? What's your favorite sport to watch? I don't know if you heard that. Okay. Um, I don't watch any sports, but if I'm going to watch any sport at all, it's going to be, like, fighting sports. Okay. Yeah. Damn. So, you don't have, do you have a favorite football team? I, I, I would be, it'd be terrible for me to say yes. Cause he'd be like, Oh, well, what, what about this guy? I'm like, I don't know. I used to, yeah. When I used to watch a lot of football, I was like a Packers fan. So, um, gotcha. and then I, I really like, uh, I liked the Oregon ducks for a while and I followed them for a while too. But after that, I just didn't really watch any sports anymore. All right. We just got a couple more. What's your favorite music genre? Um, it's going to be Americana slash folk. Okay. And then, metal core is second to that so <laughs> so the question everyone wants to know since you like americana slash folk is who's your favorite rapper <laughs> my favorite rapper um i actually do have a favorite rapper it's 42 doug so oh okay i never heard of one of them but at least you got a good yeah. at least you got one. Oh, uh, yeah it's it's i don't know people can argue with me about good music and bad music i don't care <laughs> that's okay that's okay i don't all think right, it's look. necessarily good and what, and what it's subjective right it's like what are you looking at storyline yeah yeah lyrics melody flow, flow whatever yeah. yeah i listen um, to melody and flow man i'm like you know I'm like does this have a good beat to it 42 awesome. doug is very like it's like it's like the jet it's like gent rap <laughs> to okay. me it's very like i don't know you want to me. go squat a lot of weight you have to yeah. show me in, in romania sure. um, um okay last one is just who who are the people in the sport that you look up to uh, when you're coming up and stuff that you want to like uh, shout out man looking up to uh, let me touch on that too because yeah. i don't look up to necessarily anyone when it comes to powerlifting because it's so I mean, there's definitely people that inspire me, but I don't know these people personally, you know? So yeah. I'm like, why would I want to idolize someone that like is probably a terrible person? <laughs> so you at least not, don't not that, it. not that 90%, you know, are pretty, pretty good people. But, um, I think growing up, it's just so irrelevant now, but, um, man, I don't even know. I, I mean, Ashton Ruska was definitely a guy that, Mm-hmm. I thought was just phenomenal. I mean, and I met him in person and everyone who knows Ashton, he's a phenomenal guy. So yeah, um, I think him, um, but after that, I didn't really, I didn't really like look, look up to it. I was like huge into like Pete Rubish back in the day because obviously he's like a big deadlifter or whatever. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, I would say I was, if I look up to anyone now, <clears throat> It doesn't even have to be a lifter. It could be a coach. I would, I would say like, I would say like my brother, actually, mm-hmm. um, the, the amount of passion he has for this sport is, is imagine, cause Justin is a power lifter. Like he always has yeah. been. And a lot of people forget that, that may not know him as well as I do, but like for him to want to consistently just submerse himself in the powerlifting community and 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 um you know be so passionate about other people's progress and my progress like he's been there every step of the way for me um and and that's something i hold really special in my heart um you know and and him kind of inadvertently sacrificed his his powerlifting career for that because like he's our worker and the stuff that he does is is not easy like it's no it's not travel 
Um, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's a lot Dude, of time under the screen. So, so talented. You don't just you don't just like learn that stuff overnight that he's doing. He's he's doing really high level work. Yeah, uh, it takes and, a lot um, of effort. I think to learn you know that. my brother's a real hard worker, but um, yeah. Um, I also look up to my wife, which is weird, but I mean, she's, I know <laughs> it's not she's weird, but like, she's she, is, she is, she, she handles stress and, um, man, she's just like, she's just an angel. She just handles stress and she's just got a heart of steel. It's just insane. I think, I think she does. She's very inspiring to me because of, of the way that she handles things so graciously, even though some things might be messed up. Um, in many different fashions, I don't even know what I'm kind of you know, um, pointing to here, but, you know, the way that she goes about her everyday life and goals and um, um, adversities, I think. That, that definitely inspires me. So that's why, she, that's why we're married. <laughs> and, I mean, she balances a lot and um, with med yeah. school and then like, she's really trying to do good things too. Like, yeah, she's not just the kind of person that's like, oh, I want to be a doctor so I can make a lot of money. It's like, she wants to help people, you know, yeah. she has a great heart for that. Um, so yeah, that's, those are good answers, man. And yeah, and Justin she's also never, one of the she's nicest. never, um, if you come up to her with a problem and you're looking, I'm sorry, if you come up to her with a problem and you're looking for, um, comfort, she's going to offer you a solution and what you should be doing to make yourself better. And I think that is something that a lot of people have trouble with is that they'd rather just like kind of bask in everything rather than like, Oh, like my squat sucks and this is off and this is off. She's going to be like, okay, what are you going to do to fix it? Cause I'm not going to sit here and listen to you just complain about it all day long. Cause that's not going to do anything for anybody. So I think, yeah, my wife definitely inspires me. Um, and I think that's very special. <laughs> that is, man. That's awesome. Hang on to that. I mean, the Shane Nut family, uh, the the tree of people around you, like the whole orbit around you. It's all good people. It's all nice people. Um, yourself, yourself. Justin, Chloe, uh, Austin, Lex, everyone, Dakota. They're they're just some of the best people in the sport that I've ever met. So it's really cool. You've created, you know, and all of you together have done that, and so it's really really nice. Um, so if anyone out there, if you ever get a chance to shake hands with these people, do it for sure. Um, last thing is just like sponsors and coaching. You want to plug your coaching services? I'm rocking yeah. the, the nut strength system. There you go. Shirt right uh, here. Sponsors are uh, obviously SBD. Well, I'm repping right now. World's Strongest Man t-shirt. Yeah. Uh, my, my entire closet's full of SBD stuff. Yeah. So uh, obviously, you know, Shout out to SPD. Um, the uh, the coaching. If you want to um, reach out to me for coaching, obviously you can you can go on my Instagram, you can email me, you can DM me, anything like that. And um, there's also a job form for you to fill out for athlete application. So if you're interested in that, um, holler at me. All right, bro. Well, thank you so much for your time. I know your time is extremely valuable and um, you're in the midst of peaking for the world championships, which is coming up. So everyone out there that's watching this, make sure you're going to be tuning in to root on our boy here. He's going to be in a staff class against one, another American, but some other uh, formidable opponents from around the world as well. Great Britain um, and Sweden. So definitely pay attention to that. And thank you to everyone who listens to Poverty American podcast with that. Peace out. Thank you.